afternoon. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Kerfuffle Spotlight. Really uh, delighted to have Neil on. Hi, Neil uh, from Payprop. How are you this fine day? All right? I'm absolutely brilliant, Simon. Ready and raring for this spotlight and to show everybody what Payprop's about. Don't worry. It's not adversarial. We're not trying to catch people out. <laughs> it's, all, it's, all very, it's, all very, it's all very friendly. So, um, uh, good, good. Okay. Uh, let's kick off straight away. I mean, I think obviously everybody will, um, well, or most people certainly will recognise the name here. For those people that don't have an understanding what Payprop is about, do you want to just give us a, bit, a brief overview? Yeah, I mean, we have the strap line that we're an automated payment platform for the letting industry, but it's so broad and says so many things. Basically, we're a way of an agent taking all of those administration tasks, that compliance around the client accounting, and do it in a fully compliant but very efficient way, while making sure that the service standards that we really want to be known for, and that for most agents, that's why they got in, why they set up themselves, are always maintained when dealing with client money. And that's where Payprop, it stands for that 100% accuracy 100% of the time because it uses real money flow through the bank to generate every piece of information that goes out to clients and customers. Okay, nice, succinct, punchy, punchy start there, there in terms. So you've got a couple of dream ticket items there, haven't you? See, greater efficiency, compliance, whilst obviously not the most exciting of things. If you're talking about accounts, if you're talking about accounts, probity and accuracy are, are the watchwords here, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, the way the market has changed has been phenomenal, Simon. I've been in property now, coming on close to 26 years. And unfortunately, when I started, I probably went in for all the wrong reasons. It was a low barrier to market. It looked like you didn't have to know a lot. And we moved people in without even tenancy agreements. There was no gas cert regulations. And it was a lot of it done on a handshake. But yeah. that's not our industry anymore. And yeah. that if we want to be a profession, then we've got to have that professionalism. And unfortunately, when it comes with that, the key core word that everybody hates is obviously the compliance angle. So anything yeah. that can help with that. And again, when we speak to our customers, it's not a nice buzzy word, but it's nice buzzy words that they bring back. It's the peace of mind. It's the yeah. comfort. It's the assurance. And, you know, that's what we do for our landlords and tenants. So we should have people within the industry doing the same to allow letting agents to get on and do their job. Yeah, we always used to have we used to have kind of things like property trackers that many of the CRM systems had. And I remember it wasn't too many years ago. And we, got, you know, while some saw the adoption of it as just a logical one, some really felt that it was just uh, putting too much information, sensitive information on there. I think that, I mean, realistically, and that, that was a genuine barrier. I'm guessing you had that at that time as well. But that's rapidly changed, I guess, with everything recently. Yeah. Do you know, it, it's, we say one of the things that is, is hardest for us is getting people to see the product. Once people see the product, the product makes sense. Yeah. But for a lot of people, automation, you know, efficiency, it means so many different things. I'll speak to some people and, well, we've got automation because it's their perception of reality. And almost we're, we're trying to get through the door to show something that isn't even on their radar. And when I was an agent, I haven't got oodles of time to sit and look at things that might change my world. What yeah. I've actually got to be busy doing is dealing with the world that's right in front of me. Um, yeah. And often to take that step back, to be able to reflect, it's a difficult thing to get time to do in any small business. What is it you feel about when you do, I mean, I, and I, I totally resonate with that, you know, it, the most frustrating ones you'll know when you're trying to talk to people is like, you know, you, they just don't give you the opportunity because they know the minute you see the, the proposition, you get it like that, don't you? What, yeah. do, what, 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 when do you think it is that the uh, that it drops for people? What is it about the service that, that, that really then gets, gets their attention? So, when we actually go through the process, I think it's the fact that even people who have played within this space, it's the fact that, that we've specialized in this area, that there isn't a business aspect for residential lettings that we haven't already encountered come yeah. across with our customers. I mean, even when we started in the UK, we were already tested for 11 years in another residential market. So even though we came new to the market, a lot of that learning that a new technology comes with, we'd already gone through that. And then one of the biggest frustrations I had from a property side is every technology company that came out there decided that it had to be a one size fits all. 
And yeah. most of them, it was because they'd been an agent and that's how they'd done it. And they'd gone and found a te technology solution to repeat that. Payprop has been built in such a way that its rules and the way that it's done, it can flex to almost anybody's working way. And I used to do a thing where I used to hold up the phone because I used to say, this does exactly the same. There's lots of people that have probably got the same model as me. But the moment you get people involved, the likelihood that we've got the same apps, not going to happen. Because when people get involved, we put our own stamp on it. And that's how Payprop works. We allow agents to put their own stamp while still being compliant in the way that they have their client money and their communication to their landlords and tenants. Doesn't that, create, uh, doesn't that uh, necessarily involve um, uh, make it difficult to support though if you're giving that flexibility or is it is it that you've done the thinking in advance and put the flexibility into the product itself? Um, I would say yes it still makes it difficult um, but that's why we stand behind our service and that's probably something that uh, we get spoken about the most that we are always on hand because there are still going to be client accounting worries. We're still not expecting people to be banking or accounting specialists when they're dealing within the letting industry. That's what they're, we're there for. But we do ask all of those questions. We have people within the business from banking, audit, right the way through to letting, sat there saying, what would I expect this to do at this point in time? And it's that constant asking of the questions that allows us to get the system to be in a modular manner that it will cater for all of these different eventualities and there's so much being thrown at us on a daily weekly monthly basis in letter never ends, does it <laughs> no, and it never will i don't know a single market that has entered into legislation and compliance and 10 years can say do you know what it's less than it was 10 years ago we're on that journey it only gets stronger so we may as well adopt as quickly as we can the big thing that I think has shown during the, what we've experienced recently is you are never going to get rid of the person element from this as a transactional, whether it's letting or buying a house. And I think that's been really good to see. But yeah. technology can help us spend more time on that person to person interaction. So is that what what do you see technology delivering then? What, what to you does technology is uh, technology's promise? Technology should allow us to get away from repetitive tasks. It should allow us to get from error prone repetitiveness that needs to be put into processes where we're doing the same thing over and over again. But technology should also allow us to maintain and set a standard. And that's really where I think technology is coming in and it's providing a buzz and a fix. And I've seen people with 10, 12, 20 different technology solutions but actually their processes and their efficiency as an agency isn't any better. And yeah, that's, that's, a very, that's a very common complaint, isn't it? I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a tech stack. It was meant to save me all this time and hassle. And actually, I'm not doing any, any more with that. And actually, you do need to do a bit of navel gazing and realize, well, what's the reason behind that? Yeah. And I often say to people as a business owner, there should only be two questions that we're all sat there asking. How do I protect what I've got and how do I get more? And if your technology solution cannot answer to one of those simple questions, then you've really got to ask yourself, is it right for my business? And I would say that's the other thing where Payprop and the methodology that we've taken is really good, that we don't want customers for the short time. So actually, as an annuity based business, we need customers that are going to stay with us long term. Our initial onboarding really doesn't work out for a customer that comes on, realizes it doesn't work and leave. So either it works for a customer or we are more than prepared to move away from that customer and actually say, you need to look at something else. This is not the right solution for you. And have you ever had to do that? I mean, it's great to say it, but uh, have you ever felt like you've had to have, 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 to, have to have that difficult conversation? Oh, we've had to have that difficult conversation in a number of times. If on the selection criteria for my sales team, it is not the right thing for that agent to do, then we have our our core methodology is that we're all about truth, care, and transparency. Yeah. I don't think you can have that unless you are prepared to be that transparent with a customer. You know, it's not the right thing for you right now. You have bigger problems within your business. Or actually sitting with people and saying, I would know you would love to have pay prop, but actually 
are you a letting agent at the moment the way that you're operating and it's a difficult conversation to have it is i can i, I can totally concur with that again going back to our my old crm days and, and you know on the accountancy side of things when when migrating people people would be critiquing you know oh this project's taking too long and it's like well unless you've reconciled your accounts to start off with you know we can't man magically reconcile these you have there has to be a start point otherwise you've, you've started off erroneously anyway haven't you yeah, and it, that that often is the true cost of a technology change, and that's something I would say. We're we're not afraid to go over the two technology change. We often get people saying, "Why are you telling me? Have I mm -hmm. taken into account all the training and the time that it would take to actually take the product off?" And it's because we want people going in eyes wide open. With yeah. zero contract, we don't buy any people into any time. So if it doesn't work, they can just go away from it. So we need to know that they're coming in for the right reasons for the right savings and that their return on investment is realistic. Now, often we find people overplay. So we always lowball because yeah. I would rather, and it's probably from my old sales background, but I would rather under promise and over deliver when we're dealing with a technology solution. And because of that, we've got some great, I mean, already on our kerfuffle, already our reviews where our, our clients yeah. want to yeah. promote ourselves are already saying, and again, you, you'll see from those, it's a lot of the emotive stuff that comes out. The fact that we can do all these features and the things that a salesperson might think that's why a letting agent chose it, they didn't. They chose it for the peace of mind. Yeah, and and the, the big advantage there, and I could completely concur with what you're saying about what technology is meant to do. The big benefit, of course, in terms of what you've done is if you have got, you know, uh, you've got detail, you've got automation, um, you know, the, the, the efficiencies, it is made for that accountancy thing that you're obviously focusing on, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you really can see uh, an economies of scale there as you add more and more tenancies into it, that this simply just uh, is a no brainer rather than just recruiting more and more accountants. We've had we've had people who have come on who were some of our early adopters and came on in 2015, 2016 who have been with us now for three years plus, who part of our assessment with them as a solution is that they felt they'd reached their cap. And typically it was around that 200 to 250 managed units and they remained stagnant there for four or five years. Yeah. Speak to them now and they've got three to four times that number of properties because suddenly, well, the guy that comes to me and says, I've got 50 properties and I'm worrying about whether I can actually process that. Well, now the person who's doing it, it's no different for them doing 250 to be doing 300. So now I can bring that business on without that worry. And because of removing that obstacle, we've actually found that they've gone and grown. Yeah. We're often quoted with this statistic, 23% year on year growth. And mm. it's, it's something I always check and I'm shocked by it. But actually across our platform, looking at year on year across yeah. every person, that is yeah. our average growth across the platform. And yeah grow naturally as an industry yeah that's incredible I, uh, to be honest uh, it, i'd have had to have rounded it uh, up or down because I, oh, I wouldn't remember <laughs> you're, you're far more honest than me so there you go yeah, it's gotta be as it is simon <laughs> yeah. um, it, 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 what's uh, i really i really get that uh, talking the, to prospective clients with lettings portfolios uh, over the years there does seem to be a natural sort of uh, congregation to certain numbers of managed properties, didn't they? Mm. Certainly, you said there, that 250, a lot of people get stuck at that point. I don't know whether it's like 700 to 1,000 is the next point it's there. The next one. Yeah. It's, almost, it's almost like these magical algorithms. And it's because, of course, it's, yeah, business isn't a, li a straight linear line, is it? In yeah. there, you have to have, you know, recruit people to be able to cater for that, whether that's property management staff or accountants. And then you step up again, don't you? So it's much more like a, a step of stairs rather than obviously that straight line on the graph. Yeah, and I would say the first stepping point is probably, as most of us experienced, is around that 100 to 120 mark where we could no longer do it ourselves with our one administrator. Yeah. And it had to get worse before it could get better. And I think some of that is the remembrance of that pain. At that next stepping point, we know we're going in. We know how much that hurt our current customer base because we had to almost lower our standards to get enough of a bucket to be able to then do the recruitment and the training to end up better on the other side. Yeah. What we do now is we say, well, actually you can grow and all of that training, the biggest point of contention for most landlords, am I gonna get paid? Doesn't get affected. 
doesn't slow down, doesn't change. Doesn't matter whether your employees change, that same service level standard is given throughout. Yeah. And I think that makes the, the step up to that next level seem less daunting. Yeah, it'd be fascinating to get those kind of figures. I don't know who'd be able to pr pr produce those, but at what the growth levels of portfolios, you know, where they do. Because, I mean, of course, with a system like yours, I've been saying it, none of this is linear, but it genuinely then can be much more a gradual, that gradual, as you said, 23% year on year, can't it? So, yeah. that, by the way, that's not gradual, that's stellar performance. That's <laughs> stellar. I mean, and when you look at that, remember, we take out some of the small players, but even some of those middle players, the amount of consolidation that's happened over the last two to three years has actually meant some people have seen their portfolios rise by huge numbers. Yeah. And actually dealing with that suddenly becomes a different beast. And I think that's another reason why we found our adoption, that we've we've got some good advocates within the market. We're going with yourselves as kerfuffle because yeah. everybody that's got that voice, we've got a good representation with those voices and people hear it and they think, OK, the, I can see this starting to become something. Or the other question is the people that they've had doing it for years are now starting to look at whether they may retire or move on. That seems to be another trigger point. But actually, I've had somebody who's dealt with this where it's not been a headache for me and it's possibly going to become a headache and I'd prefer to come up with a solution. That's yeah. often where we're brought in to look at the thing. And we talk about this with a solution because we're, we're not a product. The people that we have going out there happen to be talking about pay prop, but we're yeah. looking solutions for businesses and i think that's where technology companies need to make sure they're being honest and not just trying to shoehorn whether it's right or wrong their own product into a business yeah because look i mean and it's just an obvious one really isn't it a bad client as we know and, and i don't mean this in terms of them being bad but just a wrong fit mm. a wrong fit can really slow you down as a business while you try to you know crowbar a square peg into a round hole or something like that and you there does need to be as i said that actually we would all be nobody likes to say no do they but we would be much better served by giving the best advice you were talking about earlier we are and the difficulty with that is and i know i've been on one of yours where you've said this before is we judge people wrongly because of that we have a salesperson come in front and that person sells to us what we then typically say is can i speak to a customer yeah. Or tell me how good you are. And even the worst companies in the world, even Skoda at the time when everything was broken, could have yeah. probably still found a driver that would have said, best car I've ever bought. Love it. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is. It's the, it's the nature of the salesperson that they have a couple of uh, friendlies, don't they? Yeah. they will, yeah. So when we do that, what we try and say is go out to these groups. Go out to forums, go out to like Chris Watkins forums, go out to people like yourself, football, that are putting people together and ask it in an open forum yeah. because then you hear the good and the bad. Because yeah. that's then when you're taking it. Because, yeah, well, do we try and do the best for every customer we can? Yeah. 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 But we are also dealing with human beings. What yeah. we will do is always admit when something's not gone wrong, and we will fix it. I'm trying to make it. I'll try and make it right, isn't it? That's that's yeah. the main thing there. I think you're right. You know, in terms of look, the frustration is, and you can understand it because actually we're all so time poor these days. Once yeah. you've had maybe two or three calls with the with the reference list the salesperson does, and you've heard three very positive things, you know, actually you think, wow, you know, how much more can I really do? But of course, actually, in this case. It really, you need to see the, that's fine having those conversations directly, but you also need to see a volume of testimony behind that, don't you, backing it up. Mm. And that's why, you know, as I said, yes, look, you know, sites like ours hopefully give just an extra level of due diligence to people making these difficult changes. Because, look, let's be honest, changing your, you know, handing people essentially the, you know, their, their full account, account uh, uh, their full accounts for their lettings is a, is a big decision, isn't it? Oh yeah, I talk about it. We're we're a, we're not a product sale. We're not a technology sale. We're a trust sale. The technology happens to be the rails that we're using. Yeah. The banking happens to be the environment we work within. But the only reason a customer comes on is because they trust that actually what we're showing them will be delivered. And to ask anybody to trust when it's their whole lifeblood of their business, it's a big ask. Yeah. Yeah. So can you just give us a bit of a, give us a bit of background, give us a bit. Of, I mean, you mentioned, obviously, that the, one of the lovely things is your essentially your, your UK minimum viable products. It had the advantage that it was tried and tested abroad as well, wasn't it? Do you mind just giving us a bit of an overview there? Because I think that'd be useful. Yeah. For people. So, one of the things I think that also helps as a company is 
a lot of companies start out as a for-profit and then they get a little bit of a social responsibility arm and they decide to give back. We started out the other way. So we were initially a foundation and not-for-profit charity-based platform that was started by two brothers who were trying to send money back to a charity and were appalled at how difficult and how many fees were actually within that process. Mm. And so they fixed that solution. And they also did it in such a way that you shouldn't make money out of that. It shouldn't pay shareholders when you're giving money to go to charities. Yeah. But that was done. They then had this bank integrated solution that didn't make the money because it wasn't supposed to. But they looked then for an application of another industry that they could assist. And that's when they stumbled across the residential market. It's not something people often associate, but actually at the time, South Africa was probably about 10 or 12 years ahead of us yeah. in both time, money protection and actually dealing with the regulation of agents. They had the Estate Agency Affairs Board, which was being installed, and they're also dealing with the Fidelity Fund Certificates, which is their equivalent of client money protection within the market. So there was a real need for somebody to come and answer and actually deal with that. Um, did we get it right first time? Absolutely not. One of the first things within the platform, it didn't even give an agent the ability to reconcile. It did it automatically for them. The amount of panic that just puts in me, just the thought of that as being an agent, that it assumes everything correct. So we've gone on that journey. Now we operate in South Africa, we're in the UK, we're in the United States, and we also operate in Canada. And in all of those markets, there are different things that for me operating in the UK, cause me, you know, in the North American market, it's still predominantly Czech. That's yeah. something really alien to me as the letting agency now within the UK, because we moved out of the Czech market so long ago. But yeah. there are so many things within banking that PayProp is able to help and assist with. And it's just finding all of those. And we're now coming up to it being a global solution where, you know, give it five, 10 years and look at banking and how it's coming on. Yeah. Well, we're going to be having more transactions using cryptocurrencies. We've got even the Bank of England looking at a central bank uh, cryptocurrency. Um, we're getting more international investors where actually the idea of properties being all over is becoming even more open. So, you know, banking, it's also making leaps and strides. So this yeah. whole year of how it will work. And we've already seen lettings this year be subsumed into the anti-money laundering world. And again, that will only now get stronger. Now they've put lettings on the radar, it'll always be asked those same questions. And we went, what, 10 years between one directive and then we went two between the next. Yeah. So the speed at which anti-money laundering is actually raising its head up to look at these things is also something that we need to make sure we're aware of. I'm not sure this was the future we all hoped when the people were talking about the <laughs> you know, I, I was envisaging jetpacks and stuff like that, but, you know... <laughs> Yeah, where's a, where, where's the proper hoverboard that I want yeah, given yeah. in the future? Yeah, it's not good, is it? So um, we've got quite a few listeners, actually, uh, uh, and viewers from the UAE. Uh, what's interesting there is obviously they have quite a different model, more similar to America, where I think that's a lot more Czech-based as well, isn't it, there? Do mm. you, you're you talking about the global reach? Are you, are you looking to go over there? Do you have people there already? Or So we don't at the moment, and it's it, it's quite a lengthy process. For us to go into any new territory, yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously needing to get the banking relationship, getting on the banking rails, making sure we've answered all of the legislation and the compliance questions for us, because yeah. there's no point in us handling the money for our clients. And then we're also looking at the viability of that market, you know, because it is a huge cost. Yeah, right. if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna do all of that work, you've got to make sure that there's a revenue, you know, yeah. appropriate, isn't there? So although at the moment we're going into set given areas, what we're hoping is part of this open banking and the fact that transactional borders may be opened is actually we won't need to go into a separate territory to be able to operate. That could give PayProp even a bigger global reach where something like the UAE, the fact that we have that association within a global or a central banking format. But yeah. that unfortunately, that's something that's still to be developed. Banking, open banking has made its move, but it was very small. Um, the US, the, the judiciary system, the Treasury has decided now to look at regulating, but they didn't even want to look at regulating the open banking. And until there is a centralized security, we'll find a global adoption quite hard. And anyway, uh, America's got enough on its plate at the moment. <laughs> well, the world has got a lot on its plate at the moment. 
How um, just as a matter of interest, just on that point, how did your customers? How did they face it? How did they deal with with, with the whole pandemic side of things? Well. We did a whole marketing campaign, which was about even better at home for getting the new, because it was something that came back from our customers. That the fact that it is so mobile and that they weren't tied to an office, and quite often they were doing it from their mobile phones, their iPads, and because it was just a few clicks, that actually it didn't make that much difference. What they actually found more difficult was the the processes that had gone alongside that, that they hadn't necessarily digitized where mm. things are still in the office. So we found it's great. I can still do all the payments and I can still do everything. But what do I do now? Because I've got things that need to be done and all my keys are fixed at the office. Yeah, it's great that I can do all the payments and I can make all the payments and everything. What about everything else? Yeah. Yeah, but what about, okay, I now want to update this contract that's coming to expire, but all of my contract database was still tied to a physical server. So we we dealt with a lot of customers in helping them manage. I mean, one of the things that we were getting around early on is that offices had to be closed. It didn't necessarily mean that people couldn't be based from that as a single individual. Yeah. Um, so long as it's even like in Wales, it was in the five mile catchment area. They could still go to perform those duties. Um, I think it was great that we were given such a trust in uh, England yeah. open so early. Um, and I think the way everybody behaved responsibility, a lot of it, a phrase that came around during that time was, you know, health before wealth and yeah. people were thinking about our tenants and our landlords, which was really good to see. But we've seen new customers adopting PayProc quicker during this period, um, often with quite high demands in wanting to get up and running quite quickly, <laughs> taking us <laughs> the 30-day process we've got people coming wanting it yesterday um so we've had to be quite realistic in what we can provide to our customers there is a limited amount of customers that we can bring on into the banking environment in any given time but they've pushed that to its limit during this period of time because a lot of people were looking for a reason i used to do the same as a business yes i really like this but if it isn't broke don't try and fix it yeah. fortunately this broke it for a lot of people and so now i have to look at fixing it and so that solution that I saw, that I was just waiting for the trigger, unfortunately, they wanted it at the same time everybody else did. So we were then starting to back up in how people were able to be taken and go live. But we've managed to keep on top. We've managed to deal with record numbers yeah. on board and still give people that experience that they were wanting, where we've got people, even during COVID, sending hampers saying, you've done so good. Unfortunately, that can't be shared with anybody because where it might have been in a joint office before, um, <laughs> unfortunately, everybody's now based in their, their home location. Yeah. But oh, it's, it's a nice it's, way to spend an afternoon tucking into a hamper, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And look, I've seen clients of yours before, you know, that ability, as you've said, on a device, wherever you are, to be able to just look at it and reconcile it there. That, you know, compared to how it used to be, that's pretty, pretty unique, isn't it? Um, and and you are, we were talking offline. I'm sure you don't mind me saying, but you actually said because of that dynamic, uh, you know, actually you've you, you you you've broken all records, haven't you, in terms of the amount of people wanting to get on board? Because if they are, makes sense as well, doesn't it? I mean, just in terms of reimagining your business, looking at this business now, and saying, look, where do we get these efficiencies into it? A system like PayProp has to be has to be in the in the mix, doesn't it? Yeah, and the fact that our our payment system flexed. So a lot of people during the pandemic were worried because we were being given doom and gloom about what will happen on tenants being able to pay. You know, one of the stories that came out at one point that 90% of tenants will be unable yeah. to pay their rental payment. Yeah. Where, where do journalists get these stories from? But PayProp also, our payment is on a transactional basis. So if the tenant doesn't pay you, you don't pay us. So actually, when that was explained to a lot of new people coming on, that uncertainty, which stopped them going for a lot of fixed cost products, actually seemed to make sense. That actually you're, yeah. you're tying yourself to the health of my business as well. I like that. Yes, you'll get more when I grow. But if I get hit, you get hit too. So yeah. we're this together. And I think that kind of helped a lot of people to make this decision. I've heard, heard people say, if they, you know, I've never heard anyone say anything per se bad about the, the the service, the product, or anything else like that. I have heard people say on the occasion, well, it's quite pricey. Is that a fair accusation, or is it just a classic look? You get what you pay for. 
Look, since Stella dropped it and Chris Watkins used it, we've had the phrase that we're reassuringly expensive. He used it in one of you. Um, you're not telling me what got there first. I see. I'm not. I can't even get that original. <laughs> <laughs> I I remember, and I'm casting my mind really way back to when I was um, I was quite privileged at the age of around 18 to go to the Birmingham Chamber of Commerce and see a sales um, exhibition done by Victor Kayam. The Remington oh, yeah, yeah. And he company. Yeah, so good I bought the company. So he yeah. came out with this little wheel that he put up on there, and he said, companies are either fast, cheap, or good, but they God. can only be two. So if they're fast and cheap, then they're not good. If yeah. they're good and fast, then they're not cheap. And if they're yeah. cheap and good, then they're not fast. Yeah, so they're not fast and good, so we're not cheap, but we are yeah. value for money. So yeah. a lot of people would say that it's the return on investment that you get. A premium product, so long as it provides the return, it the, the value, the price shouldn't even come into our conversation. And I know that's difficult, particularly in the current climate. And I have that with some customers where we are having to watch that bottom line more than ever. But actually, yeah. what we should be looking at if we want to protect and still grow this business, which as business owners, that is always our objective to be successful then sometimes that does require that investment to get that return. And but it's only, it's only pro rata though, isn't it, Neil? My understanding yeah. is based on the amount of tenancy. So it's not like you get more expensive. <laughs> you know, it's only <laughs> if you are able to grow, as you said, by 23% year on year. I mean, it's just... Uh, it's on an average agent earning the average setup, the average service fee in the UK, then typically they need around five or six properties to cover the paper up cost. Yeah. It becomes very little when actually, yeah. you know, if they're thinking that we're still an average of around 800, once you take London out, the average, unfortunately, is still 10%. I do remember years ago, I would have seen that as a really low, but that is still our national average, but it is climbing. We are noticing that it used to be 10%, including VAT, it's back to 10% plus. So we are seeing that grow as we start seeing these new legislations come in. Okay. On that example, an average pay prop customer would be paying less than four pound a property to automate all of those backhand transactions where they're earning 80 pounds per property. So suddenly yeah. you look at something that is half of your workload suddenly being automated for a, such a small percentage, 5% of your revenue suddenly automating 50% of your workload yeah. to allow you then to go and win new business. I Again, is it for winning new business? We've had some customers come on board where they've actually wanted it so it gave them more time with family. Yeah. I've probably had one customer who can tell me that he's rapidly increased his golf. <laughs> oh, um, I was a client. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but where this works as well, isn't it, is that, you, you know, one of, the, one of the trends I'm guessing you must be seeing, and indeed you spoke about how much um, – business has happened over the last few years is that because of the increased compliance, we know that obviously mergers and acquisitions activity has massively spiked. Uh, and how does that impact on you? Do you get involved in that process when people acquire rent roles? So part of being a customer is that we actually help the customer throughout their life cycle. And we actually onboard the customers. Now, because of that, it's something that I always had as a bugbear. When I ran the agency myself, we changed the CRM system. I wasn't actively in that process, but I would come back three months later. We're not using it quite yet because yeah. we haven't managed to change over because they were trying to do it within their normal role. We try and take that load as much as we can, remembering that we've got no transactional access because it's not our data. Yeah. So GDPR, we can, we can map it. We can validate it but it's not ours to own or retain and yeah. it's not ours to have any actual actions to be able to done on the bank account. It has to be solely under the control of the agent, yeah. but we can do a lot of that workload in cleaning their data in mapping it. And we offer that service as well with any new portfolios that come on board. Nice. So they can, they can take on those portfolios knowing that actually all of the pain of bringing this over, and actually taking it from their existing system that they may have bought it from to their new system and actually allowing us to clean and validate that data first. Yeah. So actually, we they can then take their pay prop data 
and use that to populate the CRM that they wanted to move the existing portfolio over to. So there's there's some huge benefits. That's really interesting angle. That that is a such a problem for people is you know that data conversion element for for the CRM. So I, I wasn't aware of that, but I can see how that could be a big plus. Um, and and it, look, is it fair to say is there was a, a perfect sort of client for you? I mean, a lot of companies go down the mistake of of saying, look, we're right for everybody, whether it's a one office agent or a thousand office corporate here. I mean, I know that of course where you will see you know, increased, if you like, value is by larger portfolios because that, that economies of scale will really, really kick in, won't it? But, no. but uh, do you still uh, quite happily service smaller agencies as well? We do, but it is harder. So there are two fixed costs on our platform, which are the yep. bank account fee and a standard license fee. And they're not huge. I mean, they both together with the VAT are still coming out at less around the 35 pound mark so a, a low number however if you come to me with one property yeah <laughs> and you're making 50 pounds off that property and suddenly you've got to pay a small service fee of four pounds but then you've got these standard costs and now out of my 50 pounds i'm suddenly finding a, i've made six pounds in profit yeah. that until that economy is a scale however if you speak to somebody like david Votter who's one of our big advocates, he will tell you as when setting up an agency, we were the first thing he did, but he knew he was going to aggressively grow. Yeah, so I would say those economies of scale seem to work from about 10 properties upwards. They really start to make sense at about 20 properties. Okay. And that's your kind of your minimum qualifying criteria, isn't it? 10 properties. Yes. Yeah. And, then, and, and the 20 is about where it then starts to make sense. But we will speak. If somebody comes to me and says, I've got one property now, but I've got a landlord who's looking on bringing 20 properties with me. But I want to be able to show him I've got a proper solution that will allow him to know his money's being handled. Then we can work with that agent. But if we went to somebody who said, I've got two properties, I'm mainly sales. It's a bit of a headache just because I have to deal with it on a monthly, but I'm probably not going to grow lettings. That's where we would say to that customer, we're not the right solution for you. It's a good job you did, you said two properties, not three, because actually Philip has just jumped in. Philip and Marie just said, I've only got three properties, but I've got pay prop as it's future proof for when I have huge volumes. Well, there you are. I don't that was perfect timing anyway. In terms of, uh, thank, you, thank you, Philip. But that's that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's where you're going with this. You know, yeah. in terms of if you want to avoid um, the team were all laughing at me. Uh, well, they laugh at me all the time, but I spent money, as I so readily did, on, a, on an email nurturing system that I think could power the likes of Apple. But I was making the point is, you know, get that, get the framework, the structure right now, because then you don't have to worry about it down the line when it's so much more difficult to untangle a load of different things, isn't it? Yeah, and one of my customers who's been a huge success and has grown their portfolio hugely came on in 2016 with one property. So it does happen, but it's it's exactly as said in that comment. If you've got that need for a future growth when you've got huge volumes, then we want to sit down as a consultant and say, right, is it right for you now? When are you looking at those volumes? How can we assist you? Because the other thing that people don't know about PayPal is we do provide literature that actually sells the unique selling points of why an agent uses Payprop that they can use at valuation points. Oh, I love that. So this is this is one of my biggest bugbears is, and I look, I was crap at it myself, as, as many of our competitors would say, but we always forgot about, we were very good at selling the benefits to the agent, but we forgot about the ultimate B2C relationship and so the best companies, of which, of course, now you're able to step up and raise, have thought that one step ahead, haven't they? And how mm. do we communicate that effectively so that the agent themselves can use it to ultimately do the, do the sexy sizzly bit and win business? So when I tell you you can handle more business, when I tell you you've got true scalability, how do I actually give you an extra bow in your quiver that allows you to go out and win that over your competitors. And that's where I would say we take it, we're not B2B, we're not B2C, as we are just the same as in the property industry, we're person to person. And what yeah. we're trying to do is look at that end person that needs to be converted and not rely on the agent to have to sell our services, actually do the job for them, because again, we're tied to their success. So yeah. when the agent grows, we grow. 
So actually, we want to give them all of the material that we can to allow them to go out and win those instructions, because when they succeed, we succeed. Do you, you mentioned CRM there. Is there a requirement for integration? Does Payprop work quite happily outside, alongside? How does, how does that, for people who have already got CRM systems in place here, how does it work? That it's, it's always been a frustration. And I think this year it started to be answered more. But we started over the last couple of years to hear about, you know, interface fatigue, where people have got yeah. different dashboards that they've got to go into. And until open banking, it was something that was quite close to us because we had to be protective over our banking relationship and the banking rails that we had that gave us that. It is relatively easy to use because the amount of data we stop, if we think an average tenancy now, even for most agents, that's come from somewhere around 16 to 20 months, even in the private sector. So now we're automating 16 to 20 transactions, making you duplicate one. At the start. So actually, it always made sense. But it was, I would still say, it was always a frustration. That is something that we are looking at. We've developed an API that was needed to be able to talk to the app that we've now delivered to the landlords for our agents, yep. where they have the, at their fingertips. And part of the next stage of that process is we are developing an API that will then allow us to communicate that information. It's already out there for some providers to use. Mm. The difficulty I have when talking with some independents is they often ask, do you have an API? Yeah. And that would be great. But what would you do with it if I gave it you? <laughs> it's not for them. It's one, it's one thing just chucking data around, isn't it? But you yeah. need to get further ahead of it. And sometimes they'll come and say, well, actually, I'd want it to go into my CRM. But actually, unless their CRM is actually open to that, then it doesn't matter. The API, best API in the world, still yeah. isn't going to provide them that information and link. What we are finding is that there are some key players in this market that really are making a difference, and we're reaching out to those and doing that integration. So, we can to a certain degree, you've had to wait really for a lot of these CRM companies to become more open and start talking about it. Sorry, I'm just giggling here, and you certainly don't get this on the Chris Watkins show, but my, my, my lad George has just come in offering me six chicken nuggets. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I probably let down by my children now. <laughs> oh, oh, just let me check there's anything in it because that's an, another chicken <laughs> you just give me the <laughs> um so i mean we spoke about uh, a number of different things here obviously as well the fact of your success in uh south africa but what do you think is the main reason for your success in the uk um the fact that we have experts that go out and spend the time with the customer so it's not just here's paper up take it great that we actually yeah. want to find out if it's the right solution for their business. And I would say it's then the service afterwards. And being on the sales side, I have to show my hat to uh, Joanne, who's our head of client services. But that team does such a good job from the moment that they bring a customer on, walking them through the process, making them aware, but then being on hand. Doesn't matter 20 times asking the same question, they will treat you with that same courtesy and respect <laughs> the 20th time of asking and that is the kind of patience i probably don't have so which is probably why i'm not in that support side i've long had this conversation with the great people at money penny because they obviously are so much better than <laughs> with that i mean to the point that we i've always loved the esters even back when i was in um within property myself because i like yeah. something where it's not a peer group where it's people actually voting and they they go out and again you get those votes warts and all because yeah. it goes out to all your customers and it's asking so many questions. But the fact that they've got that and that they've won that award has come down to the fact that they offer so much to the customers. The yeah. amount of time that they take making sure somebody's comfortable on the platform. I've, yeah. I've seen it as coming into the company and I have never worked for a company that has looked after a customer so hard after the customers are already on board and excited about the product. 
I think you just got to, going back to our little conversation earlier about, you know, doing the due diligence as well. And, you know, I, I would personally wouldn't feel comfortable choosing an agent if I wasn't able to see, you know, a, you know, at least a background of reviews. I don't need to see millions because, again, you know, that's that raises questions of whether it's like a boiler room style thing going on. But actually, yeah. if, if you aren't able to look at something like the Estes for suppliers or Kerfuffle for suppliers and see a background, you've got to raise the question. Now, it might just be that they don't have a huge client base or that, you know, they weren't aware. But otherwise, it's because they're not getting engaged and that raises bigger questions doesn't it because then it looks like something almost underhand is going on well it does when you think of how many things are so visible now in today's society with social media and everything else we've become <laughs> about shouting about what we like and dislike yeah I mean, totally, totally totally polarized isn't it yeah totally polarized but because of that it means that if i can't see anything it makes me ask why yeah. and if i see too much good and nothing being asked, then we've got the old adage that says human beings, if it looks too good to be true, it is. Okay. You, know, I, you know, I love a customer where somebody gives me a referral and the customer says, you know what, I love this product. They could have been a little bit better with that. Yeah. This went really well. And actually they do this brilliantly. Because <coughs> so much that that's an honest response. Even if contrived, it speaks to all of the things that I would look for as a customer. Yeah. Um, so what are you planning in the future then, Neil? What are, Obviously, you've got a really exciting, as it, as it already is. Uh, yeah, well, the API is going to be a big thing for us, which is probably one of our uh, big things that we're working on um, in this year to actually how we can deal with that. Um, we're going to have to look at what we're going to do with making tax digital. That changes for our landlords from April next year. So we're going to have to deal with that. We've also got some exciting partnerships where we're actually we've spoken to our landlords we very rarely helped with the tenant side of the aspect. And mm. I would say that's something that letting agents, we always call the tenant as a necessary evil. I think that has changed. That relationship over the last five years with the Consumer Rights Act coming in in 2015, with the tenant fee ban, we've had to change our thinking and the tenant has to be seen as a valuable commodity. And because of that, we treat them better. And so we're looking at developing and we'll be releasing a, a tenant portal which will actually have services that uh, our agents will be able to have exclusive things that they can offer to their tenants to the satisfaction ratings then it will again help with that retention because if we can keep a customer in a property longer again no void times no loss of revenue means better for the agent means better for pay prop so we're looking at all the things we can impact our revenue while at the same time helping our agents Okay, and you spoke about future regulations. So, yeah, again, just like what with Ropa coming up, what, how are you going to how are you going to sort of flex to help help agents with this increase in compliance? Well, luckily, we've we've been given a little flag as to what this may look like with the Scottish Register that have yeah. a border, and actually, we got heavily involved in going and meeting with the Scottish Ministry and making sure that what we provide not only meets their Section Eight, but actually goes above and beyond that best practice. And that's what we'll be looking to do with Ropa. The okay. recommendations and everything that we've seen, there is nothing in there where Payprop won't be able to be able to still provide a better than recommended practice. Why reconcile every 30 days when it can reconcile to the penny 24 hours a day? Why yeah. are we worrying about your communication and transparency? Yeah. You have a platform that forces you to be transparent. And I think that's what we're gonna look with Ropa. Always, even though Ropa is gonna set a standard, Pay prop is about if we're going to be a true profession, let's get that bar higher than yeah. the government minimum. And although it can create a huge headache for, for people, can't it? Actually, systems, aka computer systems, then they don't mind compliance because actually if it's something you can act on definitively, that can be built into a process with automation and everything within the within systems like pay prop. Unfortunately, compliance doesn't allow for emotion, and that's great for technology. Yeah. Feeling doesn't come into it. How much I like somebody, how much I dislike somebody, how much I think they've done this well for me doesn't come into <coughs> the process. And that is the technology playground. So other than increased regulation, everything else, where do you see the market in five years? What do you see the landscape to look like? So I actually think we're going to do the same as the banking. And the idea that we are transactionally based is going to disappear. And it's going to become that service element. I see as being more of a property concierge where yeah. I have a list of services that are 
can choose. And the idea that I list a property. I mean, I remember back to the first right move days when you used to have, to have a flat and right move used to tell you the best way to market it was to put your finger on the picture and point to which flat it was on the block that you were marketing. <laughs> you know, we've come so far that I think the transaction has become almost irrelevant. What it has actually really focused on is all of that compliance, that legislation, that person management is going to come really high to the fore. And so the fact that I can market your property, the fact that I can get income in transactions is going to become almost irrelevant. It's everything else that I can do around that process as that value add. And that's where we're changing as individuals. We don't mind paying now so long as we get the service. But paying for something that's an automated transaction, mm. well, that no longer seems to be the way that actually we want to do this. It's the service that we pay for. It's the convenience. Yeah. You know, my daughter finds it absolutely bizarre that when I used to want to watch a film, I would go and order it from a shop. I'd queue up to make sure they'd get it. Yeah. I'd pay for it. I'd rush home to watch it because I'd only have it for the one night and then I'd have to go and take it back. Then I get shouts at them now because the Wi-Fi is taking too long to download. Um, everything has become more demanding and because of that we want convenience and we will because, because it's not, because it's demanding because it's then on tap isn't it everything whereas it used to just literally be software is, is moving to that SaaS model though isn't it it is Literally on a lot more of that kind of rental model based on when you need it. So you don't have to, you know, you don't have to pay for stuff you're not using and literally just consume everything that you're doing in bite-sized chunks, essentially. And as consumers, we want to do everything when we want to do it. Yeah, I want to search for a property and I want to book my view in, but I want to do it at one o'clock in the morning because I can't sleep. And I yeah. expect to still get that confirmation and get it booked. And technology can help with that. What it will never help with is that person-to-person -person connection. And that's where we will become these concierges, where we will really be valued. And I think but that's what it's freeing you up to do, isn't it? Ultimately, that point we were talking about technology, technology allows you to have more of those face-to-face -face yeah. meaningful moments. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the financial advisor that I go and see, he doesn't work out all of the products. He has a system that does that for him. But he is that expert that I go to for that advice. And that's where I see our market changing. Suddenly, with the trust levels that were... We're vying whether above or below politicians on the yearly trust chart that comes out. I think yeah. we'll be here and we'll become a profession and we'll be somebody to go to for advice when dealing with property related transactions. A good thing, good thing. Uh, Philip has just asked, what's an API? Just it's basically just uh, API is an application programming interface from, from memory. I've probably got that wrong, but just very simply, uh, uh, Philip, it just allows two systems to communicate with each other. But as uh, as Nigel was talking about here, is sorry, Neil was talking about, we were talk saying that really passing data is just one element of it. Ultimately, you need to be doing something with that data, don't you? And that's the key. Yeah, the way we look at it is it's almost you publishing a book on how your technology works and it allows somebody else to read that book and actually decide if they can communicate with it but if you take the book and you just put it on the shelf and nobody takes it off and reads it then it's just a book so uh, we've mentioned again you know five star reviews all over all over the kerfuffle page encourage anyone to go and have a look there other than kerfuffle though anil where else can uh, they find out about you the the best thing is to reach out we are no um pressure where no commitment if nothing else if you get your payment specialist to come out they'll do a portfolio review they'll look at what actually you've got they'll tell you where you sit to your competitors we can even give you advice on what we're finding other people are doing and if that's all we get and you don't take pay prop hey we've at least helped our market and that's yeah. what we're about so don't feel that by getting somebody to come and actually have a consultation with you that that means i must have pay prop yeah. Because actually part of that is paper might not be right for you. And we're making that same assessment. Part of that consultation is looking at the health of the business and making sure that we are the right fit together. Because if we're going to be in this long term, we both need to get along with each other. So feel free to reach out. We'll do that full review. There's a specialist in every area. We are still back doing some face to face as a last resort. Yeah. Fortunately, we are a lot digital at the moment, but that still is an option there because there are people who don't connect and they want to have more of an assessment. Um, but in the majority of cases, we're able to deal with that technology. And because of that, we can give more time. 
Yeah. So we can give more time to that review and we can provide more detailed information because everything's at the touch of the fingertips rather than us going to the office, gathering that information and coming back and saying, actually, this is what we can tell you about where you fit within your locale, yeah. within your competitive market. Well, we're just we're going to finish off with the uh, with the deal you kindly put on the table for our kerfuffle mm -hmm. member deal. But just to summarise before we do we do do that, so finally talking about it, what would you say? To, why what would you say to a letting agent? Why should they use PayProp? So, I, as you can probably tell when I talk about this, I'm quite passionate about PayProp. It was a cross. Passionate <laughs> when I reviewed it, and I still stand behind that pound for pound, there is not a better investment that I have come across for an agent to go into if they are serious about growing their business. There's not to say that there's not good systems out there and systems that I promote and love and yeah. I go out and promote there, but PayProp is my passion because pound for pound, I have not found anything that's a better investment. And as a business owner, I wish I'd have had this product when I started because it would have made all the difference to me and where my business went. Well, there's the challenge out to everybody as well, isn't it? And as I said, do encourage everybody to have a look at those those great reviews because you'll glean a lot from that. That's coming straight from the you know from the horse's mouth as well from there. And we've been hearing again Philippa kindly saying how much she loves it. Um, Neil, I'm really really pleased uh, to say normally uh, normally Payprop don't do any any kind of exclusive, but we've managed to cajole. Uh, show you the photos I've got on you on my phone, blackmail you, do everything we could do. But you've been really, really kind, haven't you, to actually come up with a deal for our Kerfuffle members. Um, am I okay just to say, basically, you're going to give 50% off the setup fee for any, any of the setup fees. So I think they range from, was it 395 up to about £1,495? Yeah, 1495 plus VAT, down to as low as 395 depending on the size of the portfolio, wherever you qualify for a kerfuffle member will access a 50% deduction on that setup fee. That's fantastic. And as I said, just, just subject that minimum 10, uh, 10, 10 uh, managed properties. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fantastic. We will obviously upload this as well onto all of the normal all the normal media, and we'll obviously talk to everyone we're there. You, 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 it sounds like you've got an absolute... Um, uh, no brainer on your hands there for people if they want to grow their letting sport portfolios, do it aggressively with the tick boxes, um, you know, in there for compliance and regulation as well. So, uh, look, stay in touch with us, Neil. We'd love to see how that goes and uh, and uh, catch up with you over the coming months. Excellent. Excited about joining it with Kerfuffle and we'll be excited to see where our journey goes, Simon. Don't worry. If, if all you get out of it is some pink merch, it's on its way to you. <laughs> yeah, well, I've gone with the yellow so I can easily go okay. with the pink. Thank you great. Much. Cheers, Neil. Thank you, everybody, taking part. Have a great weekend. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. Cheers.